Thomas is online, right? Thomas Kodayat Varghese with Dravidian Aesthetics in Tamil Sangam Poetry. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning to you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon to you. Yes. Uh, are you ready to do your presentation? Yeah. Uh, right. Yes, sir. So if you're ready, we have enough time, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, because we will be probably waiting for the other presenters. So as soon as you are okay. ready, if you have any presentation, you can share the screen. If not, then uh, just a talk, and then we will move on to some questions. So whenever you are ready, just begin. Yeah, I am ready. Shall I start? Yes, if you, if you are ready, you can. Yeah. So uh, good, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, so I am happy to present uh, my paper uh, titled Dravidian Aesthetics in Tamil Sangam Poetry. So uh, how I have uh, planned my presentation is I have, I, I will be discussing aesthetism, uh, aesthetics and aesthetism from the perspective of the general world perspective and then the Western perspective of aesthetism and Indian uh, perspective, then specifically to Dravidian aesthetics and uh, an overview of uh, Sangam poetry. Uh, then I uh, plan to discuss Dravidian aesthetics in uh, Sangam poetry. So aesthetism, according to the Oxford uh, Advanced uh, Dictionary, is divided as an approach to art and life based on the belief that art and beauty should be valued for themselves and not for a social and moral purpose. The term aesthetic encompasses various aspects including objects, values, judgments, attitudes and experiences. So generally uh, when it comes to aesthetism, uh, the generally known uh, concept of aesthetism is from Western aesthetics, particularly as it evolved in the late 1800s, characterized by uh, is characterized by several key principles. The maxim art for art's sake, it uh, talks about the core ideas of Western aesthetics, asserting that Art should be appreciated solely for its beauty, devoid of didactic, moral, or social messages. This moment, movement prioritizes the emotional and sensory experiences that art evokes, emphasizing sensory pleasure. In this aesthetic perspective, the beauty of language, form, and imagery is paramount. Western aestheticism often explores themes of decadence, luxury, and the pursuit of pleasure, celebrating aesthetic beauty even to the point of excess and self-indulgence. It critiques the utilitarian value of the time which plays utility and morality above aesthetics and beauty. This movement posits that art exists independently and is not constrained by social, political, or moral considerations. Indian aesthetics, if you look at, is rooted in its philosophical and spiritual foundation as a long and rich history. Central to Indian aesthetics is the concept of rasa for the emotional lessons created by an artwork. The classical Indian texts such as the Natya Sastra, which means uh, about dance forms, expound on nine fundamental rasas. Rasas are different emotions that we talk about or emotions that an audience might experience, including love, rage, and peace. This aesthetic tradition emphasizes the interconnection of art life and spirituality, viewing art as an integral part of both 
rather than a separate entity. Indian literature and art typically employ symbolism and allegory to evoke deeper spiritual and philosophical meanings. The beauty of the work lies in its nuanced interpretations and its capacity to provoke thought. A profound respect for symmetry and order is evident in the structured forms of classical music, dance and architecture, which all value harmony and balance highly. Additionally, Indian aesthetics closely links the pursuit of higher truth and inner peace with the aesthetic experience, viewing art as a means of achieving spiritual transcendence, transcendence and enlightenment. Indian aestheticism is unique and significant due to its holistic approach, which incorporates intellectual, spiritual, and emotional components. Dasan, in his book, uh, notes, Indic art imitates life as all arts do. The imitation is a two-dimensional process, gathering fragmentary knowledge of life and distilling, distilling the discerning knowledge poignant with eternal verities. Indian literary aesthetics has a tradition of celebrating compassionate humanism without preconditions or imposed agendas." Unquote. Dravidian aesthetics, on the other hand, especially as manifested in Tamil literature and Sangam poetry, possess a distinct and profound character marked by several key features. Central to this tradition is the concept of Tinai. Tinai is uh, which intricately links specific landscapes with associated human emotions and activities. Each Tinai encapsulates unique moods and themes ranging from love and valor to mourning, creating a rich tapestry of emotional landscapes. Emphasize the close relationship between nature and human experience, but the natural world is not merely a backdrop, but an essential part of the emotional and narrative fabric. The poetry conveys profound emotions and experiences directly and powerfully, enriching the aesthetic experience through its cultural identity. Dravidian literature is deeply rooted in its cultural and social environment, reflecting the values practices, and daily life of the people. Additionally, Dravidian aesthetics employ symbolism and metaphor to enhance their deep depth and resonance under Indian aesthetics, but often with a disconnection to the natural world and human relationships. The timeless and distinctive beauty of Dravidian aesthetics is defined by its unique blend of realism, cultural rootedness, and emotional directness. The beginnings of Sangam literature date back to a few centuries before Christ. There is much proof that most of the literature was written from about 300 BC to 250 AD. Sangam poetry laid down the foundation for the entire Tamil poetry tradition that has flourished for over 2000 years. Massive Tamil literary tree from which branches have spread in many different directions. About the word Sangam, A.K. Ramanujan wrote, it means an academy or fraternity. So, Sangam literature can also mean literature by uh, or a literature academy or a fraternity, literature fraternity. There are total 18 Sangam Tamil books. 10 long songs which are called as Patthu Pate and 8 anthologies called Ettu Togai for a total of 2,381 poems written by 537 poets and the female poets. 102 poems written by anonymous authors. V.S. Rajam in her book A Reference Grammar of Classical Tamil Poetry quotes there are about 50,000 lines of poetry. 
There is another important difference between Tamil and other Dravidian literary languages. The meta language of Tamil has always been Tamil, never Sanskrit. Because then generally, the, uh, uh, when, whenever it comes to Indian literature or Indian poetry, the general uh, understanding is that uh, the influence of Sanskrit is considered to be an important fact, uh, factor in all these literatures. That's why, you know, as A.K. Ramanujan says in Language and Moderniz Modernization, his book, in most Indian languages, the technical gobal diguk is Sanskrit. In Tamil, the gobal diguk is ultra Tamil. So Tamil literature possesses at least two unique features. First, it is the only Indian literature which is at least in its beginnings and in its first and most vigorous bloom is almost entirely independent of Aryan and specifically Sanskrit influences. Second, Tamil literature is the only Indian literature which is both classical and modern. While it shares antiquity with much of Sanskrit literature and is as classical in the best sense of the word, as example, the ancient Greek poetry, it continues to be vigorously living modern writing of our days. There are five landscapes which are called Thinais in Sangam poetry. And they are named after flowers and trees. These are the five landscapes are Kurunji, Mullai, Marudam, Neidal, and Pali. So Kurunji refers to the mountains and adjoining lands. So basically, in the Sangam uh, poetry, what is being done is uh, the landscape is divided into five different uh, forms. So one is uh, mountains and adjoining land. These are all uh, the landscapes prevalent in uh, South India. So Nadal refers to the seashore and adjoining lands. Palai refers to dry wilderness and adjoining lands because the South India doesn't have a desert. So Palai usually, the Tamil word uh, means desert. But since we don't have a desert landscape here, Palai refers to the dry wilderness and adjoining lands. Mullai refers to forest and adjoining lands and Marudam refers to paddy fields and adjoining lands. In addition to the plant that gives it name, each of these five thinais is associated with a certain kind of land, flora and fauna found in that land. People who live there a season a time of day and a situation in the development or fulfillment of love between a man and a woman. Sangam poetry is nature poetry. The elements of nature are intertwined with love, valor, agony, ecstasy, kindness, war, cruelty, honor, charity, friendship, and many more facets of humanity. Sangam literature is mostly secular also. Malayalam scholar K. Ayyappa Panitha praises the Thinai doctrine of Tamil as a rare wealth of knowledge not found in the languages of the world. The ancient Sangha poetry is classified by its themes as Puram and Agam. Puram means the outside uh, world and Agam means the in, in, inside or the inner uh, circle. The Puram poems view life from outside the family and deal with topics such as kings, battles, heroism, hospitality shown to strangers, honesty of the traders, loyalty of the soldiers to their king, and the king's generosity and dedication to the welfare of his subject. They provide graphic details of the society and the life of the kings, merchants, and common people in a cosmopolitan trade-oriented and religiously tolerant society. Descriptions of foods and drinks are mostly found in Puram poems. Akam poems view life from inside the family and their main theme is love. Agam poems relate to human or personal aspects like love and relationships, 
which are expressed in allegorical and abstract manner. Dravidian aestheticism holds various elements and some of the major ones are universalism, humanism, love and relationships, and oneness with nature. Universalism is one of the major elements in Dravidian aesthetics. Daniel Hoffel and Shelley Grab in the book of book Encyclopedia of Critical Psychology define universalism as universalism implies that it is possible to apply generalized norms, values, or concepts to all people and cultures, regardless of the context in which they are located. These norms may include a focus on human needs, rights, or biological and psychological process, and are based on the pr perspective that all people are essentially equivalent. Universalism is defined in Britica, Britannica as uh, that has got a Christian perspective to, to it, where universalism is the belief in the salvation of all souls. The universalist believed it is impossible that a loving God would elect only a portion of humankind to salvation and doom the rest to eternal punishment. So universalism being a theme there. So I have taken one poem uh, from the Puram literature, Purananuru of Sangam literature, poem number 192. Uh, the Tamil title of it is Yadum Ure Yavaram Kenir, written by a poet named Kanyan Pungundranar. It can be considered a poem reflecting the Dravidian aesthetic element of universal Sangam. It was translated into English by A.K. Ramanujam as Every town a hometown. So let me read. It's a very short poem. I'll, let me read it. And uh, I would like you to concentrate and look at how, how, what kind of richness this poem tries to convey. So let me read the poem for you. Every town a hometown. Every man is kinsman. Good and evil do not come from others. Pain and relief of pain come of themselves. Dying is nothing new. We do not rejo rejoice that life is sweet, nor in anger call it bitter. Our lives, however dear, follow their own course. Traps drifting in the rapids of a great river, sounding and dashing over the rocks after a downpour from skies slashed by lightning. We know this from the vision of men who see. So we are not amazed by the great and we do not scorn the little. This is from Purana Nuru, poem 192. The poem epitomizes the essence of interconnectedness and shared human experience. It begins with a profound declaration of universal kinship, posting every town as a hometown and every individual as a kinsman. This powerful opening establishes a theme of universal brotherhood, dismantling the barriers of geography, culture, and identity that traditionally divide people. Delving deeper, the poem suggests the good and evil originate internally, not as external impositions. This perspective emphasizes personal responsibility and an internal locus of control urging individuals to introspect for the sources of their joy and suffering. By acknowledging that pain and relief arise from within, the poem underscores a fundamental truth about human existence. Our experiences are shaped by our inner perceptions and reactions. Additionally, the poem advocates for equanimity towards life's circumstances, reflecting universalism. It promotes a balanced approach to life's highs and lows, neither excessively rejoicing in its sweetness nor angrily condemning its bitterness. This theme of emotional balance signifies a mature understanding of life's transient nature, fostering peace and acceptance. The poem also underscores the importance of wisdom and vision in achieving understanding and acceptance. It suggests that those who perceive beyond superficial aspects gain a deeper comprehension of life's true 
nature enabling them to navigate its complexities with clarity and calmness a book poem calls for a non judgmental attitude advocating for neither amazement nor greatness nor scorn for the insignificant this stance promotes inclusivity and respect for diverse experiences and achievements reinforcing the poem's overarching message of universalism humanism is a central element of dravidian aesthetics evident in sangam poetry underscoring the value and agency of individuals both collectively and individually this philosophical stance is reflected through various themes and ideas within the poems if we look at the same poem every town our, our hometown every man in kinship the the perspective you no know, with the highlight it highlights a sense of interconnectedness and egalitarianism fundamental to humanism this perspective emphasizes the interconnectedness of all people transcending geographical and cultural boundaries secondly individual responsibility is addressed in the lines good and evil do not come from others pain and relief of pain come of themselves this conveys the idea that individuals are accountable for their own moral choices and outcomes therefore they're of resonating with a humanist belief in personal agency and responsibility additionally the acceptance of life's transience is depicted in the poem's reflection on the impertinence of life this acknowledgement of life's fleeting nature and the equilibrium of experiences aligns with humanist views that encourage understanding and acceptance of the human condition moreover the imagery of rafts drifting in the rapids of the great river suggests rational understanding of life as a natural process subject to uncontrollable forces this rational acceptance of life's journey with its inevitable fluctuations aligns with humanist thought which emphasizes reason and empirical understanding lastly the poem's uh, concluding lines we are not amazed by the great and we do not spawn the little reflect a non hierarchical view of humanity this egalitarian stance respecting all individuals regardless of their status or achievements is a cornerstone of humanist ideals the next poem taken for discussion is poem number 172 from natrinai which is translated by ak ramanujam and titled what the girlfriend said to him when he came by daylight so let me read this poem for you it is again a short poem which comes from the agam inner circle which focuses on love and relationships so the poem goes like this playing with friends one time we pressed a ripe seed into the white sand and forgot about it till it sprouted and when we nursed it tenderly pouring sweet milk with melted butter mother said it qualifies as a sister to you and it's much better than you praising this laurel tree so we are embarrassed to laugh with you here o man of the seashore with glittering waters where white conch shells their spirals turning right sound like the soft music of bards at a feast get if you wish there's plenty of shade elsewhere the elements of dravidian aesthetics such as love and relationship and oneness with nature are also reflected in sangam poetry the poems explore various stages of love from courtship and longing to union and separation the poems reflect the societal expectations and norms surrounding love and relationships in this poem that i read the speaker's embarrassment when compared to the tree and her modest response to the man's presence reflects cultural values of humility and modesty because uh, the sangam poetry and the dravidian aesthetics focus, focuses on love and relationship but at the same time the norms of the society in uh, terms of love and relationship so here because uh, she even tells her lover that they can sit under some other tree 
as this tree is like her sister and it will not be appropriate to have courtship there. So also the interaction between the girl and the man set against the seashore backdrop explores themes of social dynamics, politeness and the tension between private feelings and public behavior. So again, the norms uh, is that. So love and courtship is, uh, is to be private and not uh, as public display of affection. Just so that is uh, part of the norms of uh, the Sangam poetry. So similarly, the poems frequently depict a harmonious relationship between humans and their natural surroundings. The notion of nurturing the tree and the mother advising the girl to consider the laurel tree as a sister indicates how nature and natural elements have been integral parts of Tamil society. So to conclude, the Tamil culture depicted in the Sangha poetry holds a lot of values and ideals. The idea of Dravidian aesthetics in Sangha poetry, which was written around 2000 years ago, is highly relevant in today's context as the world is strongly discussing and trying to find solutions on issues such as peace, conflict, environmental degradation, environmental protection, and human rights and values. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions in the chat or by unmuting you for a second? All right. If you have any questions, try to type them in the chat and I will read them out later on. Uh, maybe if I could ask uh, again, just to maybe summarize or maybe expand on what Dravidian aesthetics means. It's something new for me personally. So could you elaborate? I know that you mentioned some characteristics in your presentation, but just to summarize, what can we look for? What are those like characteristics that uh, make up this aesthetic? Uh because uh, aesthetics, uh, as we see, is a study of beauty in the art form. So when we look at uh, Dravidian aesthetics here, uh, the beauty that can be found, it's, uh, it's uh, different from the Western uh, aesthetic or aestheticism where it is uh, beauty is looked at beyond or beyond or better than moral and other values. But here, when you look at Dravidian aesthetics, it talks about uh, lots of other values. It is there, the beauty is there in the presentation of the life of people, so the love relationship of people, uh, the way people live, the universalism that they advocate, so crossing boundaries and going beyond that humanistic elements and living in oneness with nature. These are all the beauty aspects that we could find, find in uh, Dravidian poetry. The Dravidian, in other way, it also means the Tamil uh, poetry, Tamil literature, which is there, which is also the Sangam poetry. You mentioned in your abstract, right, that it's a quite... Um important literary tradition that shapes a lot of the literature, right? Are there yeah. any other, uh, let's say, aesthetics, as we call them, that also shape uh, literature in your area, in your country, let's say, or the surrounding countries? Yeah, we have, uh, yeah, generally, we have the Indian aesthetics that we talk about. Mm -hmm. But the point uh, I am making here is uh, the Sangha poetry this is 2000 years ago. Uh, so it is the beginning or it, it marks the beginning because there is always a debate uh, in India which language is the ancient. And even if you look at, uh, if you Google also, you'll find Tamil is the ancient uh, literature. But what I wanted, wanted to highlight because Sangam poetry as such, uh, as I mentioned, it is a very a vast literature and a lot of researches are being done on it. But what I 
I I was trying to focus here is uh, the aspects of universalism, humanism, or uh, relationship love of love and relationship of human beings, and uh, oneness with nature. Uh, all these are all have been discussed in the uh, Thinais or the landscape uh, literature of Sangha poetry. Yeah, even due, during the period of 300 BCE to 258. So that that has been an, uh, a major aspect discussed. All these elements were discussed there and it has been highlighted in this literature. But when we uh, we talk about romantic uh, poets like Wordsworth and Keats uh, in English poetry, where uh, they talk about wonders with nature, uh, going to uh, nature for solace, and all those elements. But uh, if you if you look at uh, Sangam poetry, the last poem that I read, uh, where it says uh, one of the three is considered to be a uh, sibling of the individual. So mother says, yeah. Uh, if you look at the poem also, it says uh, we nourished it with uh, melted butter and uh, milk. That is how, like how. Uh, a child is being nourished. So they they give uh, that kind of an importance and the oneness with nature. That looks that is a very great highlight of this uh, Sangha poetry, and that is part of the Drindian mystic. So uh, if we have to look at later, we have uh, the influence of uh, Sanskrit in the Indian literature, and uh, once uh, earlier it was Tamil. And then it divided into four languages. Uh, if you look at the map of South India, there are four states there, Karnataka, Andhra, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. So Tamil Nadu has still uh, has this Tamil language, whereas Kerala has got Malayalam, and Karnataka has got Kannada language, and Andhra Pradesh has got Telugu language. So all these languages, uh, got separated or they went from the original Tamil. So Tamil then it split into four languages. So Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada and uh, Telugu. So together it is called as uh, Dravidian languages. Dravidian languages because during the Sangam poetry we know that uh, it is Tamil literature earlier. Then it got split up. So now uh, we have influence of Sanskrit in Malayalam. Uh, Sanskrit language, influence of Sanskrit language is there in Canada and also in Tamil. But Tamil, uh, little bit it has got its influence of Sanskrit uh, like, uh, like that. But later, uh, later if we look at uh, some Dravidian languages, there are, uh, they are being influenced by the Romantic movement of the West, the uh, Greek uh, the Renaissance of the West, that type of poetry can influence uh, also be in there. But specifically, what I've taken to highlight here is the Sangam poetry, which is uh, the first and foremost of all literature. And it, it in, encompasses all these values, the aesthetic values, uh, that which are still relevant in today's past. Thank you very much for the explanation. Any other questions from anyone else? All right, so once again, thank you for the presentation and thank you for answering my question. At least I learned something new as well, a little bit different. So thank you very much. Uh,